Father, we come before you beaten up, broken, bruised, and battered, and we need your grace. God, we just need an outpouring of favor, supernatural blessings, so that you would get our attention off of us and onto you. May you open up our hearts and minds to the word of God this morning. May you change the atmosphere in this building. God, cast out everything that is against the name of Jesus, and that you would fill us up to our full capacity, God, and then overflow us, God, so that we may touch the lives of others. Lord, let your love penetrate us into our hearts in, in, in uh, radical ways that people would know who our Father is by the way we conduct ourselves and the way we love one another. And so, Lord, this is your time. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, welcome, y'all. Happy to see you. I don't see Bill Donahue. I wanted to give him a hard time, but... Um, he's here. He's here. He's somewhere. He's hiding because he knows I'm hunting for him. Um, he gave us a real softball for kingdom trading. Like, I just can't believe how easy of a topic this is. We're going to discuss why a loving God would command people to commit genocide. Oh. Easy, right? Like, why? You know, come on. This is elementary, right? Early in the morning. <laughs> But, you know, as a special blessing, you know, it was really good for us to be able to do this. I think Sarah was on hour seven of research last Sunday night, <laughs> and I couldn't get her to pull away from it, and I couldn't get a word in edgewise. She's like, you just can't believe what was going on. I just read all of numbers. So that being said, I would highly encourage anybody else to be interested in doing a kingdom training to do it because you do learn quite a bit, even if it does get a little bit off track and into the weeds here and there. Um, it really is awesome to expand our knowledge of God's word. And it's cool because you really get to feel who God is and you get just a better sense of him. So with that, I think Sarah's going to start us off and give us a little intro and let us know what's going on and who the players are. Yeah, so we're going to do a little bit of background and introduction before we really get deep into the topic. So our passage for today is Joshua 1, 1 through 9, and we put all of the passages that we're going to use on the slideshow, and we're going to be going back and forth through a bunch of books, um, because when we did this topic, we found that just reciting the Lord's word uh, gave us all the answers that we needed. We didn't Amen. need to make a whole lot of conclusions because it's all right there. So uh, you are welcome to go through your Bible, but uh, we can make it easier for you just by having it on the slideshow. So in Joshua, the speaker is God and the audience is Joshua. Um, in he, the setting, here's the setting. So the Israelites are on the east side of the Jordan. Um, they're right across the river from their promised land. And they've been wandering the deserts for four, almost 40 years now. And uh, they are out of their captivity, obviously, and uh, have long left Egypt. And their leader for the last 40 years has just died. Moses has just died. He watched over them all this time when they're in the wilderness. Moses spoke directly to God. They were, he was their conduit. And uh, I could imagine that they are all very distraught at the moment and um, just mourning over the loss of their leader. And Joshua has now been appointed as the new leader. And you might wonder, well, why Joshua, right? Uh, what's the big deal about this guy? Well, let's look first. There was a census uh, of how many people they had, and they only counted the men above 20. And at that time when Joshua was being appointed, there was 601,730 men. And this didn't include the Levites, which was another 23,000. It didn't include any of the men that were under 20 or any of the females. So to be chosen as the one leader amongst probably almost 2 million people is kind of a big deal. Wow. Yeah. Um, so why was he chosen? So in Numbers, um, it talks about what Joshua had done many, many, many years ago, actually two years before the... Uh, Two years after the Exodus. Two years after the Exodus, in number 13, we read that 12 spies were sent out uh, to go and recruit and look at this promised land and see what was happening. And uh, they were gone for 40 days. And when they came back, they had a little something to say. In number 13, we read, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. 
here is its fruit. So they were told when they were out scouting that they were supposed to bring back the fruit of the land so they could verify what was out there. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Immaculites live in the Negev, the Hittites Hebusites and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. So they're talking about all the people that they saw there, and they were fearful of those people. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for certainly we can do it. So here's one guy who's kind of opposing what everybody else is saying. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people, they're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilims there, the descendants of the Anak that come from Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. So they were really fearful of... Scaredy cats. Yeah, scaredy cats. <laughs> scaredy cats. Um, so then we see in Numbers 14, uh, Joshua. So Joshua is speaking now and he says... Um, or sorry, here's a report of Josh, what Joshua says. Numbers 14. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of... Jephana. Thank you. Who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes, so they're really upset, and said to the entire Israelite assembly, like here standing up to the people, right? The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So this is Joshua standing up for what he saw and knowing that if they had the Lord's protection, they could do it and they should do it. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. So here's the one guy and his buddy, Caleb, who are like, yes, let's do it. God said we could. It's been 40 years. Come on, let's go. And they want to stone him. Then the glory of the Lord appear, appeared at the tent of meetings to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs I have performed among them, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. So God is upset, right? He's like, come on, guys. Hello. <laughs> we can do this. I will help you. I split a sea for you. Yeah. I got you out of another nation. Manna has happened. There will be quail. <laughs> There's all these great things. Come on. Get with the program. Come on. Yeah, so really uh, Joshua is uh, a good leader for the Israelites. We can see that. We can see that both Joshua and Caleb, two of the 12 that were sent out to spy, understood um, that God's will would be accomplished if they were faithful. But the Israelites pretty much wanted nothing to do with it, and that, again, angered God. After all they had been through, after all the miracles that Todd talked about, uh, they were still doubtful and they were still fearful, and they needed a strong leader. Um, and we know that Joshua would lead them in. Uh, another reason Joshua was chosen is because he was his person, uh, Joshua was Moses' personal aide for the basically 40 years that they were out there. So he knew uh, what it was going to be like to have to command these two million doubtful, fearful... Whiners. <coughs> chosen people. <laughs> I'm a whiner too. Chosen people. And, you know, why should Joshua be the leader? Well, God commanded it, right? In Numbers 27, we read, um, So the Lord said to Moses, so this is the Lord talking uh, to Moses, obviously, Take Joshua, son of Nun, the man in whom the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him. Ha oop, commission him in your presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he 
and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. So one, he was faithful. Two, uh, he was commanded. And three, he already had a lot of experience. So let's read our passage for today, Joshua 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. So this is how we know he was Moses' aid. Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, all the Mediterranean Sea to the, e to the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. So God told Joshua to do something very, very important. So important that he said it three times in this passage. Do you remember what it is? Be strong and courageous. Yeah. And uh, the title of the sermon today that Pastor Kevin is going to cover is Courage. And he's going to share why and how we need to have courage in our lives. And I feel like the passage gives it away pretty quickly. So I don't want to bust you out here, but all right. <laughs> verse 6 Faith says... Faith comes by hearing, hearing word, by the word of God. It's again a repeated and again. process. Yeah. <laughs> We can have courage because God swore, <coughs> verse 6, it says he swore um, that he would give the promised land to the Israelites. When God promises, he promises, and he's not going to break that promise. Mm -hmm. Verse uh, 7 and 8, we can have courage because if we obey his laws, we will be prosperous and successful. I don't know about you, but I have that desire, so I try my best. Uh, verse 9, we can have courage because he will be with us wherever we go. He's never going to leave us. So we should have courage. We should not be concerned or nervous or what else did we say about the promised people? Whiny. No, let's, yeah, let's not go back there again. <laughs> okay, so um, because this is kingdom training, we're going to look at a couple different questions with a little bit of a different angle. Uh, the first question is, okay, why is God telling Joshua to be courageous? What's the big deal? What is he supposed to be doing? Is this really that hard of a job? Besides, they already survived 40 years when you think that they couldn't. Um, but we know that Joshua is going to lead the Israelites into Canaan, and he's giving him very specific instructions on how to do that. And in Deuteronomy, we hear, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, you are entering to pos mm, possess. Entering to possesses and drive? Possess. 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 Oh, thank you. Okay. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drive out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jezebites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God has deli delivered them over to you and you are def have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take your your daughters for your sons. Sorry, I don't know why take I can't read daughters. this. Thank you. Don't get married, basically, um, to them. Intermarry. What are you trying to say? Don't get married? 
two. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Intermarry. Anybody married to Hittites? So, anybody, anybody with an ite on the back of their name, don't marry them. <laughs> so there's some very specific stru- instructions. Yeah, he has to be courageous to do all this. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are do- to do to them. All right, so here's the instructions. This is why he has to be courageous. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, which I think were like... Um, they use poles. them uh, ceremonially. I yeah. Believe. Burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Mm. You know, a totally another good topic is why the Israelites... But Let's not, not get too far into the yeah. weeds. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what happened if they were courageous? Okay, God says do this. What if they do this? What's going to happen? Deuteronomy 6. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to his fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to you a land with large, flourishing cities you didn't have to build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not have to provide, wells you didn't have to dig, and vineyards and olive groves you do not have to plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So I just had this vision, you know, when I was studying of like doing a long, agonizing road trip because that's kind of what the Israelites were on. Yeah, and it was very frustrating, years. and it was hot, and I didn't get to eat when I wanted to eat. When Are I we did there eat, yet? I didn't Are get... Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> no ice cream. <laughs> and then... You I'm get tired to the, of manna. You get to the hotel room, and you just flop on the bed. The and smoke they have, from the pillar of smoke was burning my eyes. They have room service, and the pillows are comfortable, and I don't have to make the bed because there's a lady for that. And <laughs> Check under the pillow. There's a chocolate. I oh, promise. yeah, there's a mint, you know. I mean, that's what it was going to be like for them. It was, it was all there, and it was going to be amazing. All you got to do is slice some giants. No yeah. big deal. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 7. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love. Remember, he doesn't not do something he said he would do. He will love and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine, and olive oil, the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flock and the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. You will be blessed more than any other people. None of your men and women will be childless, nor will your livestock be without young. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on those who hate you. The disease part's enough for me. Right. But all that other fruitfulness, the oil, the wine, the grain, the multiplication of your flock, like what a blessing. They had to be courageous to do a really challenging thing so that they could be blessed. And even though the 40 years weren't really a stroll in the park when they were in the wilderness, um, God was going to keep his promise. Deuteronomy 7, you must destroy all, all the people. The Lord your God gives over to you. Do not take, do not look on them with pity and do not serve their gods for that will be a snare to you. So this leads to another question and a very concerning question and the real question after all this amazing buildup is why would a loving God order the Israelites to take land from someone else and pretty much ask them to commit genocide? Um, is this an order from the God that we know to be so loving that tells us to love our neighbors and the same God that forbids us from stealing and coveting and murdering? And you may recognize these commands from the Ten Commandments, right? And let us be reminded of the first commandment in Deuteronomy 5. You shall have no other God before me. And the second commandment, you shall not make yourself an <clears throat> image of the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth uh, or in the waters below. So the, one of the problems was the area that they were going into, the promised land, was full of idol worship, full of it. And, um, 
and it gets worse. <laughs> yeah. So we have to remember that our God is a loving God and he is also a merciful God, but evil does not go unchecked. Ooh. You can't have one without the other. The command to destroy these nations was God's judgment uh, against worshiping of false gods and creating idols. And God was using the Israelites to cast his judgment upon the people within the promised land. Um, it was also a safety measure for the Israelites. If there were no traces of other gods, if there was no evidence of um, ability to do false worship, by default one would assume that they would only focus on the one true God. However, unfortunately, they'd already proven that if there was just a little bit of an ability to um, serve another god or have doubt that they would take it. We see that a lot, unfortunately. Hence in that one verse, there was the, don't look to the right or to the left. Like, God's going, man, you guys are idiots. Like, just keep your <laughs> eyes forward, okay? Like, how more can I, you know, put this out in front of you? Like, just go this way. <laughs> We're like that. No deviation. <laughs> we, we shouldn't judge because we're like that as well. Right. Okay, so God was going to use the Israelites to, to um, judge the idolatrous nations. And he was going to wipe them out and remove any traces or temptations to serve other false gods. But why Canaan? why the Israelites uh, being there was such a big deal? I mean, isn't the world big enough that they could go somewhere else? Why this specific area? Well, no, they couldn't go anywhere else because, one, God keeps his promises. In Genesis 12, it says, God promised Abraham this land. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land land so he built an altar there to the lord who had appeared to him so god promised so that's kind of how it had to be two uh the land was amazing and god wants the best for us so he's gonna give it to us in deuteronomy 8 it says observe the command of the lord your god walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out of the valley and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Sounds pretty nice. I think I'd rather be there than out in the wilderness. You had me at olive oil and honey. <laughs> <laughs> and why did they have to go to that promised land? God promised it. It was going to be awesome. And he had already demonstrated his protection over the Israelites, so they'd be okay. He'd already demonstrated his power, so they'd be okay. He already demonstrated that he exists, so they should listen and obey. Uh, he showed many times that he was going to keep his promises, and he also uh, showed many times his own judgment. Even upon the Israelites, he annihilated lots of Israelites for not obeying. Right. So uh, he the 23, wasn't... 23,000 that were taken down with the uh, poisonous snakes? Yes. And then we have right. those who died who ate the quail, like way more than their share. Right. So yeah. he wasn't just protecting them and letting them get away with the injustices. They also worship false idols. So he was also putting his judgment on them. Um, they were walking in a straight line, not looking left or right, but when they did, he had a stick to correct so there, them. <laughs> yeah, there were great consequences for not following the Lord, and we see it a lot. Um, so they needed to be doing what he said. Um, you know, don't forget about the flood either. I mean, we, we see uh, God's wrath there as well for the people who don't obey. So um, they needed to go because God told them to go. And, you know, when God says obey, we should obey. And when God says go, we should go. And when God says have courage... We should have courage. He's in control. He has the power to overcome all things. His plans are perfect for us. Amen. So let us not go through trials like Jonah did just to end up where we're supposed to be uh, when we could have just went there right away. So they needed to go. Um, 
And that's a, a little bit of a background and introduction. Todd has a couple more points to talk about that are a little bit more in depth. Oh, I think you did a great job. No? Uh, okay. So we're done no, early kidding. today. No. <laughs> so, um, you know, that uh, Sarah did a great job of doing all this research, and it was really cool. Like as we learn more and more about this, you know, the the scary part of this topic is why would a loving God command his people to commit genocide? And, you know, I did a lot of research on the web on this, you know, because it's the easiest. Hey, Google, <laughs> I got a question for you, you know. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I see a lot of people that were talking about, oh, I had this conversation with my friend, and my friend said he couldn't love a loving God, or he couldn't love a God that, you know, commanded people to commit genocide. And, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, no, your friend's looking for excuses. Okay, let's get over that. But we need to be prepared, and we need to have answers to these questions, right? And so, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, for starters, let me read off a verse. Romans eleven twenty two. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Okay, right there we kind of have the spirit of God. You know, he, he, he dangles a carrot and he drives with a stick, right? Um, <laughs> you know, he wants to keep us in line. Um, the reality of it is, you know, I kind of, what came to my mind when we were studying and looking at this was like, we just had some, uh, we just had some cantaloupe from our garden. And they were about this big, tiny little guys. We planted no cantaloupe. <laughs> so these guys came up as volunteers, right? And this vine comes out and produces two cantaloupe that are in between a softball and a baseball size. And they weren't getting any bigger, so we decided to cut them. And believe it or not, um, they were beautiful inside. They were nice and soft and tender. And when we scooped out the seeds and gave them to the chickens, which the chickens appreciated, I mean, they were just, they were great, but they were little. Well, then the plant didn't produce anymore. So what do we do? We yank it out of the ground. Because it's no longer producing, why are we going to exert watering, time, care into a plant whose life cycle is done and is no longer productive, okay? So, although it sounds kind of harsh, when we look at what was commanded on the Canaanites, because, you know, we're in Joshua, but also the Malachites, and actually there was, I think, seven different uh, groups of people that had to be driven out of uh, the land of Canaan, right? When we look at that, we have to take in consideration, like, was it a necessary act, right? So one of the things I noticed when I was doing research, I kept coming across is a lot of theologians were talking about, well, you know, at that time in history when people would write things, they do used a lot of hyperbole. And I'm looking at the word hyperbole, I'm like, I think I know what that means, but I better double check. And it's an exaggeration, right? So exaggeration was common in writings at that time. I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. Um, I felt like people were using that as an excuse. Come and on. What bothers me is, okay, if we can use, if we say there's exaggeration in the Bible, in the early part of the Bible, what does that mean in the later part of the Bible, right? I mean, did he really turn water into wine, or was there a little wine in the bottom of the cask, and they poured the water in, and it mixed, and it turned out to be okay? You know, was the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, was he really lame, or did he just have arthritis, Hmm. You know, I mean, if we allow exaggeration at any point into the Bible, I just have a problem with it. And granted, there's theologians that believe that, you know, oh, he didn't really mean genocide. I don't know. I, I want to take the Bible as literal because worst case scenario, what if we take exaggeration to the point that Jesus didn't die on the cross? What if he was still alive when they took him down? We can't have that. So to me, my personal opinion, I can't believe that there's any exaggeration in this. But just to back that up, let's go to Exodus 17, 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name Amal Am I can't Amalek. Read. Amalek from under heaven. This is referring to the Amalekites. Uh, what happened here was the Israelites left Egypt and they haven't even found a source of water yet. And the Amalekites come in and just start going after them and start beating up on them. And there's this great battle. And God actually favors the Israelites because they shouldn't have won it, but they did. And after that, God's like, all right, Moses, write this down. Make sure Joshua knows it. We're wiping these guys out. We can't have this. 
Um, what actually ends up happening is there's several hundred years where the Amalekites keep coming around and they're constantly harassing the Israelites. They're always on their flakes, flakes, flanks. They're stealing their crops. They're doing all sorts of crazy things. That's why God ended up wanting them to be completely wiped off the face of the earth because they're a constant problem, right? It's kind of like the old Wild West. You know, people would get in a gunfight and you shot my paw. And, you know, you end up with like this thing going on for generations over, you know, over what happened years ago. And so that's one of the reasons that God did command genocide, you know, because you can't have that. You can't have those people coming back for retribution. So... With that being said, I'm of the mindset that, yes, God did actually command genocide. Um, he you know, literally wanted the people wiped out. Um, one of the considerations here, as I was doing my research, a couple points I ran across, you know, God created everybody, everything. God created the earth. He created you, me, the plants. So he has ownership. So... Granted, once again, you know, loving God sounds kind of cruel to wipe out people, to kill the children of a people, but his property, his choice, right? It's like the garden. Just like the garden. You know, if you're, you know, if it, if you possess it, then you are to take care of it, right? Um, you know, not only was God the ultimate maker ruler, but he's righteous in what he does. Uh, in Deuteronomy 32.4, you know, all... God's ways are justice. So with that being said, if all God's ways are justice and if God is love, then his justice is done out of love, right? Um, we all deserve God's judge. judge man, I can't talk today. I know, me too. My li- it's like my lips are tight. We all deserve God's justice. None of us deserve God's mercy, okay? Ooh. So you think about in history when these things happen, okay? You know, there's the flood. God, this, this world had gotten so perverse and twisted that God had to wipe it out. But at the same time, he gave Noah the forethought, the knowledge, and the instruction to build an ark. And then he drove the animals to Noah to save his creation. I don't know what happened to the dinosaurs. That's another kingdom training. But, um, you know, to, to bring on the generations after that, you know, so um, among God's judgment, he also provided mercy. You know, it's the same thing with, you know, he... He brought on the plagues to Egypt, right? But he did that for the purpose of getting the people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So when we see something like, you know, the genocide of the Malachites, uh, the Canaanites, the Hittites, you have to understand part of that's also a blessing to his chosen people. Okay, so it's a two-sided thing. Yeah, it looks terrible on one end, but the opposing end, he's giving a blessing to someone else. Um. We also have to remember the Canaanites were enemies of God, and they deserve to be punished. You know, it's not like they were just sitting there doing their thing, and, yeah, you know, they said their allegiance to a different God, but that was the end of it. No, these people were pretty rough. They, they were into some really bad stuff. Um, I would have liked to get a little bit deeper into it, but I kind of ran out of time. But they were, um, from what I can tell, they were into worshiping Baal, uh, which is basically direct <laughs> Satanism. Um, they did sacrifices of human beings, including children. Um, they, they, they lived their life in a way that if they were here on the earth right now doing the things they were doing back then, we would definitely be sending people in to take them out. You know, I mean, they, they committed things that were just absolute atrocities. And they've been doing this a long time time you know it's they uh one thing i read uh suggested they had over 400 years to try and correct themselves in the time frame before the israelites came and wiped them out maybe if they had another 400 years they would have turned around i just know if i had another 400 years i'd turn around (laughs) you know (laughs) so in actually in deuteronomy um nine five it says not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going to possess their land? But because of their wickedness, or the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. And that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, you know, he's also kind of like, don't forget, you guys have kind of been morons too. It's not about you're so good that I'm giving you this land. I'm fulfilling my promise, and these people are jerks, and they need to go. Um, <laughs> Todd speak. <laughs> I, I am not going to produce a, a version of the Bible. Trust me, it would not turn out well. 
<laughs> so God's action, um, when it comes to making these commandments, it was not an ethnic cleansing. That's something else to keep in mind because for some reason right now everything's about racism and you know people try and turn this turn everything into racism. It wasn't a race thing that was going on with these cleansings, right? You have to remember there was uh, Rahab. You know her whole family got saved. You know it wasn't about who they were as a people. It was about their choices, right? Um, also the Hivites, uh, the Gibeonites. Um, you know they turned around at one point as well, and God was going to you know lay the smack down and, and move them out. But because they turned, uh, he allowed them to stay. Um, basically what it comes down to is it's about the actions that the people are taking, you know, almost like a little bit Martin, uh, Martin Luther King sort of thing here. You know, it's not about the color of the skin. It's about the actions that people take, you know, and that God just, you know, demonstrates that he's not just like take these people out. He's saying, you know, it's because of their actions that he's taking them out. Um, you know, as Sarah kind of touched on earlier, you know, it's a big world, right? Wasn't there another land of milk and honey? I mean, did you really have to take out all these people? All right, well, of course, there was the promise. But the other part of that is you have to understand what's going on in Israel at this, or with the Israelites at this time. They're a theocracy, okay? So they, were, they had one person interpreting what God had to say to rule the people. You can't have that and have people in your nation that don't believe in God. It just doesn't jive. Wow. I mean, it's almost, you know what it'd be like, Kevin? It'd be like bringing in a bunch of people that had different beliefs and swore to take out the West and just bringing them into your country. It'd almost be disastrous, wouldn't it? <laughs> just suggesting. <laughs> but it's the same mentality, right? You can't have people that, that loathe you live under the same roof. You know, they were a theocracy, and to have people that did not respect that it just wasn't going to fly, so they needed to be removed or driven out. Um, another thing to keep in mind with all this is this is a picture of what's to come. You know, it's a picture of what had happened in the past and what is to come because God did have the flood. He did have to cleanse the earth. Um, when it comes to the land of Canaan, he had to have the Israelites cleanse that land to make it be theirs. And in the future, because of um, our beliefs, because of our faith in the Lord, because we've accepted who he is, what he's done for us, because we've changed our lives because of that, we have a specific future after the end of this earth. He's doing it again. It's going to come. And this is a picture of that. This is to show his seriousness as well. As much as we really enjoy going flipping into the new testament and reading about how jesus and god and love and you know puppies and kittens and all the warm fuzzy parts of the bible and how we love each other you know as i started out with um you know god is a stern and strict god and we need to keep that in mind um you know i've made me really think quite a bit reading this and just the way that there were so many people that were just destroyed and it was because of where they were at in their lives, and they did not take God seriously. Even the chosen people. Even the chosen, even his chosen people. Um, an, an interesting thing I kind of ran across while I was doing this was uh, one person's opinion that makes sense to me. You know, keep in mind the Israelites were the chosen people, but their role as being chosen was to be a blessing to all other people. Come on, right? And you know, we've taken on that role as well because you know we're grafted in. So it's our responsibility to be a blessing on others as well. <sighs> Something kind of interesting I came up with at the end of this is um, when we see things that we don't necessarily agree with, the character of God, you know, the idea of genocide, the idea of wiping out a people, it kind of proves his existence. Big step. I know, but let me explain, okay? There's no slide for this. There's no slide for this. <laughs> um, you got the rope. Let, me, right, let me explain where I'm going with this. You know, I'm, I'm not going too far off trail. But, you know, in, in, Greece, in Greek mythology, right, we've got these gods that were composite gods that man-made, right? We know that. And you look at their characters, and you can almost kind of, like, figure out what the type of person was that came up with this God, you know? It's probably, you know, like I was thinking, I was, when I was talking to Sarah about this, I was thinking about uh, Zeus, right? You got another guy who came up with Zeus had slaves. 
Yeah, because here's Zeus sitting up there on this cloud with a lightning bolt in his hand, right? And then the people are below him, and they're just there for his amusement. It's like, man, that guy was a rough slave owner. You just know it, right? As we make up things, we put in attributes of ourselves into them. But when we have a God that we don't understand what he's doing, we don't even get the reason for it sometimes, it promotes the fact that he isn't just some synthetic made-up thing Amen. that he existed before. And when, when, the Bible, when the Bible suggests things about our God that we have to sit down and spend seven hours at a crack reading numbers to try and figure out, it shows that this is a complex issue, and it's above and beyond you know, what we would tend to make up. Um, Kind of, um, is it, does that make sense to you guys? Does it, does it seem logical that, you know, if I were to make this up, I would, I would look at God differently. He would be a, a lot more. Puppies and kittens. Right, maybe chocolate. a unicorn, you know, chocolate, right? A little, little honey and olive oil like we talked about before, right? But when we come into these hard issues, it, it proves the depth of God. And also it, it kind of reinforces us for reasons to study and to dig deeper, to understand the the characteristics and the personality of God. Um, in closing, let me just read off a uh, uh, a quote from C.S. Lewis. Um, before I read this quote, though, there's one another word in here that I had to do a little searching. <laughs> so let me give you a definition for a word before we get into this. The word is iconoclast. Bill, do you know what an iconoclast is? <laughs> in, okay, in case you don't. Um, the definition of an iconoclast is a person who attacks cherished beliefs, traditional institutions, etc., as being based on error or, st or superstition. All right, one more time. An iconoclast is a person who attacks cherished beliefs, traditional institutions, etc., as being based on error or superstition. That's important in this. So C.S. Lewis said, my idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. He shatters it himself. He is the great iconoclast, a.k.a. person who attacks cherished beliefs, traditional institutions, as being based on error or superstition. So God, he is the great iconoclast. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of, his, one of the marks of his presence? Instead of rejecting God because we don't like what the Bible reveals about him, we seek to understand more deeply who he is. Great quote. I remember in, um, I went to a Christian school and we had to read a lot of C.S. Lewis stuff and I hated it. I thought it was so dry. And now I'm kind of looking back going, you know, Mrs. Curry's right. I need, think I need to pick up some of his stuff again. <laughs> this was for you, Mrs. Curry. Right, for you, Mrs. Curry. <laughs> okay. Got a couple comments, and we'll take one question. What they were saying, the evil of the land. Remember the picture of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Abraham saying to God, God, if there's ten righteous people, would you not save? Right. And he's trying to make a bargain with God, and they couldn't come up with righteous people to he save. start at 50 or something so like that? So <laughs> you look at the land, and you're saying, well, there's a reason why. Two, um, you just mentioned um, about God breaking that image. Mm -hmm. It's because that image in Greek mythology is an image that's trying, well, it comes like this. We're trying to make God into our image. Right. And it don't fit. That's why it keeps getting broken. Right. Because God doesn't fit an image made like man. He's beyond that. So just a couple key points, and then we got time for one Yeah, question. when you think about it, I mean, like, if I say God, what pops in your head? You know, you, you kind of tend to have an image of a human is that really the case? I don't know. You know, I mean, I think that God is way beyond the presence of a man. I mean, there's just no way of taking and roping that in. Bill, you look like you might we have got something one you question. want to say. Bill, this is a, we only got time for one. First to comment. One, I think you just raised the bar. For oh, me too. <laughs> that was great. Uh, King of Training, excellent job. Uh, you had mentioned that you ran across a number of people that were trying to say God really didn't order genocide that were taking this too literally right and you came to the opposite conclusion that he really did mean what he said that yeah genocide. Uh, how would you relate that multiple times in the bible it talks about the potter and the clay jeremiah 18 Romans 9 says 
does the clay have the right to the potter? Right. To, to say anything. And in the Jeremiah 18, it says that the potter created one vessel that was marred and destroyed it. Right. right. Is, is that in line with your conclusion on, on God's right to do this? Yeah, I think it's completely in line. I mean, you know, really, when it comes down to it, no matter how far Sarah and I dug into this topic and how far we got out in the weeds, because we did. Um, you know, I just I keep coming back to biblical principles are consistent regardless of where in the Bible it is. You know, God is consistent. He always is. And even though you might be talking about the attributes of him being a loving God, you might be talking about the attributes of him being a, a just God, doing whatever it took to be just, it's always the same. You know, he is consistent throughout, whether it be the clay or it be the Canaanites. Amen. Amen. Guys, we don't have enough time for any more questions. I would encourage you, though, if you do have questions, please talk to Todd and Sarah. They'd be glad to answer those things. And uh, I know there's like three or four going on, but it's <laughs> we're going to close in prayer. So, Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time. God, we thank you that you're above our understanding. Hallelujah. We need help. Amen. And we need help beyond us. We've tried to fix things, and all we've done is mess it up. But we look to the righteousness and holiness of God. And it helps us to see that there's more. We look to your grace, and it helps us to want more. We look to your love, and we cry out, please, God, more. Because your ways are perfect. And, Lord, as we dwell in an imperfect system, imperfect world, take us past our knowledge and our understanding. Let us put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.